your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to pretend to see everybody today. We are in Nehemiah chapter 5. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 5. If you don't know where it is, it's right after Nehemiah chapter 4, right before Nehemiah chapter 6 on page 259. If you're still a bit lost, start flipping through your Bible till you come to the Samuels, the Kings, the Chronicles. Right after 2 Chronicles, there's a little book named Ezra, and then Nehemiah comes after that. Nehemiah chapter 5. So in chapters 1 through 4, Nehemiah has left uh, the, the capital of Persia to come to Jerusalem to set up, the, or sorry, to build the walls of Jerusalem. They had been broken down many years ago and never rebuilt, and so now he's coming to rebuild them. Um, and he gets here, and he gets the work. He riles up the people, and they get the work. There's opposition. The enemies of Israel make fun of them. They, still, they say, you'll never do it. The work doesn't stop. They threaten to come and beat them by force and stop them by force. The work still doesn't stop. The people are holding a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Uh, they set watch day and night looking for the enemy. And so as they are building, they're halfway up now, and then we get to chapter 5. We get kind of a little uh, inside discouragement going on here. Chapter 5 says, And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. So the wives are getting in on this cry too. For there were those who said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore let us get grain that we may eat and live. It's like, hey, we're hungry here. We don't. We, there's a lot of people, not a lot of food Please give us some grain. There are also some that said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. So in that time there was a famine. Uh, my guess is the famine is, is since the people of Israel were building their own houses and not building up the temple, not building up the walls. Uh, God sent a famine. That's his, his reminder of, hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. He holds back the rains and then the, the, the ground doesn't grow the crops. And they're like, because we don't have a whole lot of crops, we're hungry. There's a famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Now our flesh is a flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. Indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been bought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them. For other men have our lands and vineyards. Uh, so right now, here's the problem. These guys come with a problem to Nehemiah saying, hey, we're hungry. We don't have enough food. There's a lot of people here. A lot of Jews from all over the area came back to Jerusalem, um, and, and they haven't had time to plant fields and to reclaim their houses. Other people have mortgaged their lands. They said, well, we used to have land, but then we, we lease it to somebody else so that we could, so, so that we could get, buy bread. There wasn't enough bread because of this famine. And other people said that, well, we've, we've worked so hard on this wall that instead of working on the wall, uh, we we've, we've, uh, haven't been working on our fields. And in doing so, we've had to borrow money from people, from, each, from other Jewish people, uh, in order to buy food. And now we're kind of running out, and we can't pay that money back uh, because we weren't getting paid to work on this wall in the first place. And therefore, we have to sell ourselves into slavery. In that day and age, uh, what they did was, if you didn't have money, if you didn't have enough money and you needed to borrow money, you could uh, sell your land to one of your Jewish brethren, and he'd give you the money for it. And after 50 years, well, doesn't not 50 years from that day, but every 50 years, there's a year of jubilee, and that land would be returned to you. So you would get that land back. Uh, as far as I can read in the Bible, it gives us a lot of explanation on what to do in the year of Jubilee, but I haven't seen any recording of them actually having one, uh, which is so sad because God says, hey, take a year and have a party every 50 years. And they're like, nah, I don't want to have a, a year-long party. Who doesn't want to have a year-long party? Um, and then on the other, on the other hand, uh, the, if you don't have any land left and you're still hungry, you still didn't manage your money well, or there's just you don't have enough land to buy food, you could uh, sell your kids into slavery. Like they, they'll go work for somebody else uh, so, that, so that you and your family can have food. Or you would go work for somebody else if you are able-bodied. And so that's where these Jews are. They're on their last leg. They have nothing else to do. They are already have, they're already slaves or have their family slaves working for somebody else. They've lost their land. They're out of money. They're out of food. 
they need help. So they turn to Nehemiah. He seems to be the one with all the answers. And so this is what Nehemiah said in verse 6. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. Why is he angry? Well, he's going to go on and say, After a serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, Each of you is exacting usury, or, or that's interest, from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. So he hears this. He gets angry. And you know what he does when he gets angry? He goes off and thinks a bit. He prays. You know, he doesn't just respond in his anger. He thinks about it. And, and there's a lot of people who talk about righteous anger uh, and, and, and getting angry. Um, and, and they want to justify their anger. So they say this is righteous indignation. The Bible says be angry and do not sin. Jesus did it. Moses did it. Well, it's like, well, I don't know. When Moses got angry and he uh, hit the rock, God says, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Right? And so, so in, in Moses' anger, he did sin. Um, and, and when Jesus was, was clearing out the temple, it wasn't just he went in, saw it, got angry, and kicked everybody out. The Bible says he went away, made a whip of cords, and came back. Like, that took some time. And I think it's just he was cleaning house. That was what he was doing. Um, and I haven't met anybody who's been able to do the righteous anger thing right. Uh, they, so far, everyone I've met who've, who've said they've had righteous anger has not had righteous anger uh, because they sin while they do it. And, and that's how you know, right? If you're sinning while you do, if, if it causes you to sin, it can't be righteous anger. Uh, so, so I say give everything to the Lord and let the Lord move you from then on. Um, the, the, the output of anger, like if you feel angry, what you do, that is wrath. And the Bible says the, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Uh, so just be careful what you do and how you do it. And, and if you are, are thinking, man, this person needs to pay, justice needs to be done, uh, vengeance needs to be taken, I would say give that to the Lord. The Lord will take the vengeance. The Lord will create the justice. Uh, he doesn't call us to do any of those things. He, uh, he calls us to love each other. He does not call us to judge the earth. And says, he says, don't judge uh, one another. And we leave that to him. One day we will judge the earth. And when I say we will judge the earth, really Jesus is going to judge the earth. We're just going to sit by and go, yeah, that's the right, righteous judgment. Good job, Jesus. Because he knows it. He knows the right answer. He knows how to say things right. And, and we mess things up all the time. Um, so let's just let him deal with that. But Nehemiah became angry, and then he goes off, and he thinks a bit. I bet he prayed because Nehemiah was a man that prayed. And he calls everybody together, and he says, hey, you guys are making money off of your brothers, right? And so in that day and age, the Jews were not supposed to charge interest when they lent money to other Jews, because they're all one big family, right? If I have, a, well, I have three brothers, if I lent them money, would it be right for me to charge them interest when they pay it back? It's like, okay, I'll give you, you know, $3,000 to settle whatever debt you're, you're trying to take care of, but I want you to pay interest on that. It just would be weird, right? He's my brother. If I'm going to lend him $3,000, I should just lend him $3,000, uh, and, and not charge interest because we're brothers. And so that's how the Jews were supposed to handle it. That's what was commanded in the Old Testament law. Uh, they could charge interest to non-Jews, but they couldn't charge it to each other. Um, so verse uh, 7 says, he called the great assembly. Verse 8 says, and I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. He shut them down. He says, hey, we just came back from all the other nations. We just got everybody, well, everybody who's here, back together again. And now that we just escaped the, the bondage of these other nations, are you going to put your brothers in bondage again to you? What makes you think you are going to be a better ruler than those guys? And the answer is you're not. You know, I, I, was, I was reading, and I forgot which one I was reading, about... Uh, about slavery, right? And it's, it was about like man wasn't meant to be a slave to anyone. Um, and, then, and then somebody else writes like, well, it's, it's true. Or, or no, sorry, I take that back. It says man was meant to serve. Man was meant to be a slave. It's man's right place to be a slave. They were in favor of slavery. And then someone says, well, okay, I'll, I'll agree to that. Uh, but I haven't found anybody who is, who is worthy to be a master yet is worthy to own other people and to be a slave master. And I would say if you're going to be a slave to somebody, be a slave to the Lord, be a slave to God, because he will treat you right. And if you are not a slave to God, you are going to be a slave to sin. It's just one of the two. You get to choose who you serve, but 
You need to serve someone. Either it's going to be God or it's going to be sin. Which one is it going to be? If you think you can rule your own life on your own without God, guess what? There is a hidden puppet master pulling your strings, and that hidden puppet master is sin. Sin likes to make you think you're doing okay on your own, but you're really not. Um, and, and if you're like, well, no, I'm perfectly fine. Well, the, here is a test. The stuff that you want to do, decide not to do that for a while. You know, it's like, oh, I'm hungry. I want to eat something. Well, then don't eat. If you don't eat and, you're, and your master is the Lord, he will sustain you while you're not eating. It's like, well, I, I feel like I need to, to, to watch this or listen to this or, or sing this or smoke this or, or do that. You know, and just try not doing those things. Try Try not doing any of those things and see how that goes. And you'll realize that that desire in you becomes so strong. It's not strong because you always fulfill it. You're always giving into it. So it's easy to think, well, it doesn't have control over me because it's not very strong. But when you stop giving into it, it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And you're going to realize that you are really a slave to whatever it is. And so, um, and, and if you can stop doing it, well, then great. Maybe you should just stop doing those bad things. Um, and, and, and then start doing something good in its place. So Nehemiah says, hey, what you're doing is not good. This is verse 9. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of nations, our enemies? It's like we are an example to the people around us, and, and, and we are telling them that they've been bad to us, but we are doing the exact same things to each other. How is that honoring God? Verse 10 says, I also with my brethren, my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please stop this usury. Nehemiah says, hey, I came here. My servants came here. Everybody who is poor has been asking us for help. We've been giving them money to pay off their debts. And it turns out it's just going to you. Because you're charging them interest, they're having to borrow more money from us to pay you off. You are getting rich off of your poor brethren. Stop it. Stop taking advantage of other people. And I'll say this about, about our economy and just economies in general. You can't make yourself richer without somebody else getting poorer in the mean, uh, instead, right? In order for you to make more money or to get more stuff, somebody else has to lose that stuff. Somebody else has to, to lose that money. And so, so where is it coming from? If you're taking money from people who are poor, taking everything that they have so that you can make yourself more rich, that just sounds wrong because it is wrong. You're not supposed to be rich off of the backs of the poor. We're supposed to help the poor. And so, so do what is right, and what God leads to you is right. And, and if you're thinking that I just want a, a get-rich-quick scheme, guess what? They don't work. Uh, the ones that do work are the ones that work for the wicked people who are, who are uh, scamming everybody else, right? So if someone comes to you or some website or some phone call or email or whatever saying, hey, do this, and you will get rich quick. That is their get-rich-quick scheme, is to scam you and a bunch of people like you so that they'll get rich. So don't be that person to scam other people, and don't fall for it. If somebody says, I can get you a lot of money for not a lot of work, they're lying to you. You're supposed to work. God made us in these bodies with hands and feet so that we can actually do work, that we can help each other out. It is what we are here for. And, and if you read the book of Proverbs, which I'm, I'm, I'm going through um, on another study, but if you're going through the Proverbs, it talks so much about how people are lazy and, and how bad that is. It's like we really do need to work for our own benefit. And maybe you're retired and maybe you're unemployed right now and you're like, I can't work. Well, if you're unemployed, make your job trying to get a job and go out there and get any job you can get, even if it's below what you think you should have. Even like, man, that's really lowering myself, lower pay, lower position to take this job. Take it, work hard at it, you can work your way up. Or at least while you're doing that, you could still be looking for a better job. But at least you would have something coming in. You'd have a reason to wake up and get out of the house every day if you're allowed to leave the house nowadays. Um, and if you're retired, you have a job that God has given you. Uh, that you need to spend your time on. God doesn't say, okay, you work for 30 years, now you get to sit in front of the TV for the last 10. That's not his plan. His plan is for you to work. You can mentor younger guys uh, who do what you used to do. You can, you can uh, go and, and share Christ with people in the parks or, or go to the prisons and do a prison ministry. 
Uh, you, can, you can even write letters, even though people don't do that anymore, but you can write letters and help other people who are retired uh, feel like they have a purpose in living. There's so many things that you can do. You just need to pray and ask God, what do I do with the time that I have, with the money that I have, with the energy that I have, big or small as it is, lot or few, whatever I've got, how do I use this for your purposes? How do I use this for your gain? And I'm confident that God will reveal to you what he has for you for now. And what he has you doing now may not be what he has you doing next year or the year after. It could just be for now or it could be for the rest of your life. You don't know. I don't know. Only God knows. And so he's the one you should be asking. Uh, but use your time wisely. And don't take advantage of people who, uh, who are, are poorer than you. Verse 11 says, this is his instructions, Restore now to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, and also a hundredth of the money of the grain, the wine, and the new oil that you have charged them. So stop being jerks. Stop charging them interest. Give them back their stuff. Let's start over. Give it back to them. You can afford it. Um, and so then they, they agreed. Verse 12 says, we will restore it. You'll notice that when Nehemiah speaks, uh, and he charges them. Everyone always agrees with Nehemiah, right? The Jews always say, yeah, okay, we'll do it, because Nehemiah is such a good and strong leader. But sometimes they don't follow through with it. Um, we'll see that later on in the book. But Nehemiah thinks about this. He's like, okay, well, if you say you're going to do it, I'm going to make it official. I want you to sign the contract, sign on the dotted line. I've never had to sign on the dotted line. All the lines I've had to sign on have been straight lines with no dots. I don't know why that came about. Uh, okay, it says, restore to them now. And then they say, verse 12 says, we will restore it and we will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then Nehemiah says, then I called the priest and required an oath from them that they would do according to the promise. And then, um, so it's like, well, okay, you said you're going to do it. Now I'm going to call the priest in here and make it official. You make an oath before the Lord uh, and before these priests. Now you are legally required to do as you say. Verse 13 said, Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus he must be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen. And they praised the Lord and the people did according to the promise. So when I read about this shaking out of the robe, uh, then it was kind of a, a, a show of like, I'm leaving this behind. Uh, this is no more. When, but when I read about it, I think about my kids after they're sitting down and they're eating their crackers. Let's say they're outside eating crackers. And after they're done, there's like, instead of eating their crackers, it looks like they just crumpled them up and put them in their lap, right? That's what kids are like. So after they eat the crackers, like stand up and you brush them off. You brush all the crackers off. The dog comes and eats it all up. And then like, that's it. Now it's gone. And so I kind of, that's what I picture when Nehemiah shakes out his robe here. He's like, okay, the same way the crackers fall off the kid and the dog comes and gets them and they're gone, that's going to be you. You're going to be shaken off. You're going to be eaten up by the dog. And, 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 and it's, that's going to be your punishment if you don't do what you promised. Uh, so they all said amen. They all praised the Lord. And even though this is a rebuke, this is a strong rebuke, they still praise the Lord afterwards because the wise love to be rebuked. They don't love the process of being rebuked, but they love the actual uh, action of, uh, of, of the rebuke because it means that they now get to walk closer with the Lord. If you are, are following a trail and you make a turn onto a side trail that's not the right trail, I want somebody to tell me I'm going the wrong way as soon as possible because that's the least amount of backtracking I have to do to get in the right trail. If I, go, if I go down 100 feet and someone says, hey, that's not the trail, you're, you're supposed to be over here, then that's great, I can go back and go. If I go a mile down and someone says, you know, the trail's like, well, I am so far away now, or two miles, and it's like, man, that's so far back just to get to where I'm supposed to go. I'd rather just be on the right road in the first place, but if I'm not on the right road, I want to know about it. Can you imagine if I, if I was like, supposed to come to your house and I turn the wrong way on the freeway to drive to your house, and I'm driving down, and you give me a call saying, where are you? And I'm like, I'm still on the way. I can't find it. And then you ask, well, where are you now? And I tell you where I am, and you're like, well, that's the wrong way. Turn around. I'm like, nah, the world's round. I'll get to your house eventually. There's many ways to your house. I don't have to follow your directions. I'm too far gone this way. I'm just going to keep going. It just drives me further from, my point, from where I'm trying to go. 
It is the wrong thing to do. So when you get rebuked, praise the Lord that you get rebuked so that you can act in, in that corrected spirit. You can act in that correction. You can put what is right into practice. And, and it's a thing of our pride. We don't want to be wrong. I, I tell I, married couples that, you know, like when a guy tells a, a wife he's beautiful, that feeling that she gets of being called beautiful by her husband, it's great, right? Guys get that same thing when, we're, when she says you're right. You know, when she says you're right, it's like, oh, I'm right. Yeah, that's, that's the equivalent of telling a girl that she's beautiful. And so, so, so we want to be right. We love being right. But we're not always right. And there's some guys like, well, I always am. But you're not, we're not always right. We make mistakes. And if we're making a mistake currently, we need to be corrected as soon as possible so that we can stop making the mistake and start doing the right thing. And we need to be humble enough to realize that I get things wrong a lot. And we say that, you know, like about stuff that like without being specific, oh, I get things wrong all the time. And if you're like, well, name one. It's like, uh. And we can't think of one because we think we're always right. And so we really have to realize that we're not. And we do things wrong. And when, when our wife or even our kids, uh, definitely our friends say, hey, buddy, you're not doing the right thing here. We should stop and go, you're right. I didn't pray about it. I, I, need, to, I need to repent before the Lord and before my family. Because I don't want to do the wrong thing. I want to do the right thing. I don't want what I do to be the right thing. I want to do the right thing. We're not trying to lead the Lord in righteousness. He's leading us in righteousness. So let's follow him. So they say amen. They praise the Lord. Then they did it, which is good that they did it. Verse 14, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be governor of the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of, of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, Neither I nor my brethren, my brothers ate of the governor's provision. So from 14 on, uh, well, 14 to the, the 18, Nehemiah is going to remind the people or remind uh, us through his scripture uh, that he's being a leader by example. Um, he's telling people, don't take money from your brothers. Um, he, as governor, is allowed to get money from the Jews in taxes so that he can, he can live, but he decided he's not going to do that. He's going to do everything on his own dime. So he didn't, take any of the, he didn't take any of the provisions, the salary, the governor's salary, he didn't take it. He says, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. He says, because I was afraid of the Lord, I had fear of the Lord, because I respected him and his people, I did not take a salary. I, didn't, I did not allow any of my servants and anyone who worked for me to take a salary from the people. Nehemiah paid for all of it. He was the king's cupbearer, right? He had to be wealthy. And so he's like, I took care of all of it. It didn't cost uh, the people a thing. Uh, verse, and I think a lot of leaders, like leaders should get paid for what they do, but they should have that heart of being able to do it for free. It's kind of a weird, weird mixture uh, of feelings that I have about that. Uh, verse 16 said, Indeed, I also continued to work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And when you buy a land, remember, ne if Nehemiah bought land, he would have to buy it from one of his Jewish brothers, uh, and that would take their land away because there's only a limited amount of land around them. It's not like here where you, know, you could just buy stuff that's on the market. There it was assigned to each family, and if you bought something, you're taking it away from a family. And so, so Nehemiah decided he's not going to buy any land. He's not going to get rich off of his job for the Lord. He's just going to do his job for the Lord. Um, and I think that's very honorable. He's leading by example. All those other nobles in the area who have been getting rich off of their brethren are serving under this guy, and now they got him to look up to, and it's an example being set. And they see his conviction. They see his blessings, um, and, 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 and they, hopefully they follow it, which later on they don't do for sure. Uh, but for a while, maybe they do. Verse 17 says, And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, beside those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowl were prepared for me, and, and one and every ten days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. 
Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. And so he kind of lists like the animals that are killed daily for them. Um, he says, I had 150 Jewish, guy, uh, Jewish leaders at my table. And, and then there were more people from the countryside who heard about this work and are coming in and I'm feeding them too because they just got to town. And so uh, some scholars estimate that the animals he listed here would feed about 500 people, talking about the women and children as well. Um, and so like that's a lot of people and he's paying for that daily out of his own wallet because he's not accepting a salary, he's not, taking, he's not collecting the taxes from the Jews, which he was allowed to collect, uh, but he wants to do this as, as his own tribute, as his own honor to the Lord, so he does that. And in verse 19, he says, Remember me, my God, for good, according to all I have done for this people. He's not making a name for himself in the eyes of the people. He's not saying, See, look how great I am. He's going to the Lord and saying, God, remember that I'm working for you. That I'm doing all of this for you. And so, like, what are you doing in your life that you can go to the Lord and say, God, I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing this so that I can be known as this great godly guy. I'm not doing this so that I can be made rich. I'm doing this because you told me to do it, and I'm doing it for you, and I'm doing it just for you so that I can serve you. You're my loving father. I'm your, uh, I'm your, your loved son, and so I really want to serve you in this way. So think about it for a bit. And there are, there are things that, that God calls us to do and that we do for him because he tells us to do it. It's kind of like a command. And then there are things that we do on top of that, uh, that that we do just because we love him. And my favorite example of this is, is King David, right? King David, he looks out his palace window as, after he becomes king and, real, and sees the tabernacle and says, man, I have this great palace built out of cedar and God has a tent. Why can't he have a palace? He should have a palace better than mine. So he tells Nathan, his prophet, saying, hey, buddy, I want to build a palace for the God. Nathan says, yeah, let's do it. Sounds good to me. Uh, Nathan, pray about it or, or anything. He just said, yeah, sounds good. And this sounds like a great idea. I, I probably would say said the same thing. But then God comes to him when he's sleeping and says, hey, I never told David to build a palace for me. I don't want him to. He's a man of blood. So I need you to go back to him tomorrow and tell him that he may not build it for me. And, and can you imagine just the humble pie that, that Nathan had to eat as he goes back before David and says, Hey, David, uh, I, I misspoke yesterday. I, I'm supposed to represent the Lord, and I didn't. God told me last night that he doesn't want you to build him a palace. He says, You're a man of blood. He's going to let your son do it. And David, guess what he did? He praised the Lord. He's like, Okay. If, now that he knows what God wants him to do, he does that. But you know what he does after that? is he starts gathering materials. He gathers all the materials necessary for Solomon to build a temple. He just stores them up so that when Solomon becomes king eventually, he has everything he needs to do the thing that God wants him to do. David says, I know I can't do this because God said no, but I'm going to do everything I can to get ready for it. I'm going to do everything I can to help because he loves God so much. And then Solomon, of course, spends a long time working on his own house, even though David already had one. I don't know why Solomon needed another one. Uh, but he spent so much time in his own house that when he got around to building the temple, he actually had to go gather materials again. I wonder what happened to the materials David got. But there's a difference between the heart of, of David and the heart of Solomon. David's heart is for the Lord. Solomon's heart was for himself. So where is your heart? Is it for the Lord? Because if it's for the Lord, you're going to help people out. You're going to take the resources you have, whether it be time, energy, or money, and you're going to spend them on other people so that they can come to know Jesus better, that they can come to live life better with the Lord, not necessarily more comfortable with material things, but with the Lord uh, than they were before. But if your heart's for yourself, you're just going to try and make yourself as comfortable as possible. And we do a pretty good job of that in America. We've got nice fluffy couches. We've got big screen TVs. You're probably watching me on one right now. Uh, and, and, and we're pretty comfortable in America, but sometimes we're too comfortable. A lot of times we're too comfortable. And what we really need to do is take the focus off of ourselves and how to make ourselves the best and help other people out. And so, um, so let's do that. And let's start with prayer. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. Thank you so much that we can come before you 
and, and, and in the midst of this rebuke that Nehemiah gives to, to, the, uh, to the people of Ju Jerusalem, we can look at our own hearts and say, is this us? Are we taking advantage of other people to make ourselves rich? Are we taking money from the people who can't afford it to give ourselves comforts that we don't really need? Are we doing the right thing? Are we doing enough for you, Lord? Because even if, even if we, we, we are working hard, we may not be working hard doing the right thing. And if that's the case, Lord, I want to be, I, I want to be corrected so that I'm going the right direction, that I don't spend all of my energy doing something that I'm going to have to undo later or that you're going to have to undo that I could love you freely with all of my heart knowing that I'm following you in the right way at the right time. And if there's someone out there who is not yet a Christian, you have not yet given your life to the Lord, this is the time, this is the night. You are watching me because God has put it on your heart to turn this on or put it on somebody else's heart to ask you to watch this. And you need to give your life to Jesus tonight. The truth is that you've sinned, you've made mistakes, you've, you, you, you've, you've sinned against God, and that the wages of sin is death. And because of that, you deserve to die the most horrible death imaginable, death on the cross. But Jesus loves you, and he died on that cross for you, so that he took your place so that you could live even though he dies. And he rose again from the third day to prove it was enough, and if you just believe that, Jesus died on the cross for your heart, for your sins. You believe it in your heart and you say yes to Jesus. He will come into you and you will live forever. You will be a Christian. You will be uh, a, a child of the living God. If that's you, I'd say raise your hand, but I can't see you anyway. But just pray this in your heart. Jesus, I'm sorry I have sinned. I know the wages of sin is death. You died on that cross to take my place. And you rose again on the third day. I believe this. I accept you into my heart. Please be my king. Let me be your child all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that for the first time, give us a call, 894-1441, and let us pray for you over the phone. Uh, let, us, let us encourage you. Let us, let us help you figure out what comes next uh, now that you are a believer, now that you are a Christian, now that you have eternal life. What does that look like? What does that mean? Give us a call and find out. 530-894-1441. Let's pray just one more time before we get back to music. My Lord Jesus, you are an amazing God. We love you so much, not because uh, we are good, but because you are good, because you loved us first, Lord. We shout your name. We sing your name in praise because you are worthy. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen.